And uh, I'm going to I'm going to read a verse in John chapter 20 because it's resurrection day. And I'm going to go to John chapter 11. John chapter 11 for the sermon. But the Bible says over here in John chapter number 20 in verse number one, the first day of the week. The first day of the week, that's Sunday. A lot of people, you hear people pray sometimes in churches on Sunday. They say, Lord, bless this Sabbath. Well, Sunday's the first day of the week. Saturday is the Sabbath. We worship on Sunday on the first day of the week. And uh, Jesus rose the first day. We meet together on the first day. Now, don't get me wrong. We worship every day. But we here at church, we have our church services on the first day of the week because of Resurrection Day. So if you're a saved person, you won't argue with this one I'm about to say. If you're a saved person, every day for you is a resurrection day. You're raised to walk in newness of life, but also every day is a Sabbath day for you in that you are resting in the finished work of Christ. Now, we have it recorded in all four Gospels, the resurrection. We have it foretold in the Old Testament. So we have the Bible that tells us, and the Bible even says over in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, that the gospel is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Not only that, but he was seen. Brother Dana said he was seen above 500 brethren at one time. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, I believe that with all my heart and believe that with all my soul. I'm a saved man, so that says I'm serving a living Savior. Yeah. Dead saviors can't save. Yeah. Amen. I, so we serve a living Savior. Now, here's what the problem is I've found uh, in dealing with a lot of people that they have to have an authority. They, you need a standard. You need an authority. And I don't know how many people, I don't know how many people, especially in this day and age, have come up to me and says, well, what makes you right? Or what makes you think you're right? Well, the question I would ask them, what makes you think you're right? Amen. What makes you think you're right if you disagree with the Bible? You have, in other words, you have your own standard. So if I went around the room or went around Milton, especially Milton, Florida, the state of Florida, the United States of America, around the world, then I could not disagree with anybody because everybody, what everybody thinks, they have their own standards, so everybody's right. And so there's complete chaos. Or we have a standard. We have a standard, and the standard is the Word of God right in front of us, the good King James Bible. Yeah. If uh, you have a standard, then what he says is true. You say that makes you narrow-minded. It sure does. Amen. It sure does. Jesus Christ is very narrow-minded when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So here's your standard. And so we look at the standard and we thank God for the glorious resurrection. If we didn't have a resurrection, if we didn't have a res resurrection, the Bible says over in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 19, I, I am of all men most miserable. If there's no hope whatsoever beyond the grave, beyond this life, then we are of all people most miserable is what the Bible says. All right, go to John chapter number 11 and let's look at this resurrection. Let's look at what Jesus taught about the resurrection. In John chapter 11, in John chapter 11, you have two key verses, two key verses. In John chapter 11, verse number four, the Bible says when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. See, he heard the news of Lazarus. In verse number one, the Bible said, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and his sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And then verse 4, let me read it again. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be, might be glorified thereby. Look at verse 40 of that same chapter. Now, we're looking at verse 4 and verse 40 being the two key verses in this chapter. Verse 40, Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. Now, we talk about the glory of God. We're asking God to open your eyes that you may see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that eyes would be open, ears would be open, dear God. Hearts would be receptive to what you have to say today. 
in and through your word, Lord. This is our authority. This is the standard. It is uh, the very word of God in print. We know it's the Lord Jesus Christ in print. We ask that we'll heed the word of God. Pay attention to it, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, now in chapter number 11, we're looking at the critical man. His name was Lazarus. We read about him there in 1 and 2. Then we move on to 3, 4, 5, and 6, and we see how concerned that the sisters were. It was Mary and and Martha, I want you to notice the character of their request. The character of their request. The Bible says in verse 3, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Here's my need, is what basically they were saying. Here's my need. I leave it with you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Here's my need. I leave it with you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So we had the concerned sisters. They went to the only source for help, and that was to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have the disciples that was very concerned as well. Very, If I could use the word, they were cringing. The cringing disciples, we find them in verse 7 uh, through 10. The Bible says, then after that, in verse number seven, saith he to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again. We don't want you to go. We don't want you to die. We don't want anybody to stone you. They loved him. You know, and even Thomas, Thomas uh, said right there in verse number, uh, uh, what, what is it? Uh, verse 16, Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. And every time you think of Thomas or hear somebody talk about Thomas, we automatically think about the doubting disciple because he didn't believe that Jesus Christ was risen unless I see him with my, uh, and put my, hand, my finger in his, uh, holes in his hand and in his side. I won't believe that he's real or he rose again. We give him a bad rap, but if you'll notice, he was the one that says, let us go die with him. Just let us go with him. He loved him. Thomas loved the Lord. So they didn't want him to go. So we see the cringing disciples. And then, of course, in verse number, um, uh, after verse 7 and 8, that fear that was fostered by what Jesus had said, then we have the reassurance uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ that we can go. The Bible says in verse number 9 and 10, uh, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. In uh, verse chapter number nine, I was trying to look at that verse and trying to, you know, just, just what I thought about that verse 10 in John chapter 11. And then I'm reminded of John chapter number nine and verse number four when Jesus said this. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The night cometh when no man can work. What we're looking at in John chapter 11, Jesus said, it's still day for me. It's still day for me. The night is not far off and it hasn't come yet. In other words, the day that I die on Calvary's cross and shed my blood and pay every sin debt every, and satisfy all of the demands of the holy God, that night has not come yet. So it's still day and I'm walking in the day. I've got work to do. My meat is to do the will of the Father and to finish His work is what the Bible says. Hebrews said, Lo, it is written in the volume of this book, I come to do thy will, O God. Jesus was always constantly aware of the will of God. Why? Because He was God in the flesh. All right, and then we see the confident Christ in verse number 23. Verse number 23, with all that's been going on with Lazarus and the news about Lazarus, the confident Christ, Jesus said in verse 23, thy brother shall rise again. Now, back in verse 17, we move to this matter of faith, which is the essence, by the way, of pleasing God. Does not Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 6 say, uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please him? So the essence, the essence right here of pleasing God is faith. How do we get faith? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want enough faith, get in the word of God. You say, I don't believe the word of God. Read it anyway. You read those dime novels, as we used to call them. Now, you can't get anything for a dime anymore, but you read everything else. Why don't you read the Bible? Open the Bible and begin to read it. I can't understand it. Read it anyway. Read it anyway. And as you read it, ask God to open your understanding. And I promise you, uh, he knows your motives and he knows your desire and he will open your understanding. He says that 
in Luke chapter 24, by the way, that he opens understanding. If you really want to know and you're concerned about this matter of heaven and hell, uh, you're going to get in the Bible and find out who he is. And, by, and Jesus Christ, when we talk about him raising, he was raised bodily. I said this Wednesday night, as we were talking in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, but man has created a living soul and man is created to live forever, forever. Now you're going to live in one place or another and you're either going to have a body given to you according to 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. You're going to have a body given to you suitable for heaven or you're going to have a body given to you suitable for the lake of fire that will never burn up. You're going to live forever. Whether you, whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen. Amen. It's going to happen. You say, who are you? Well, I have my authority. I have a standard. Yep. If I had everybody else's standard, then I'd put it away. You know, that's universalism. Universalism is teach everybody that there's plenty of paths to heaven. We had a president like that, that all paths lead to God and it doesn't matter which path you choose. That's called universalism. You, know, the, you ever heard of the universal church? It's not true, my dear friend. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. The confident Christ said, the confident Christ said, thy brother shall rise again there in verse number 22. In verse number 17, the Bible said, then Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. We move back to now, we need some faith here. This is kind of difficult. My brother's been dead four days. How in the world is my brother going to live again? Mar Mary and Martha thinking physical. Verse number 24, Jesus is talking spiritual. Look at verse 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Martha was thinking about an event in the future. Now, Martha was a saved woman, but she is holding on to those Old Testament promises that people will rise again. So she's talking about something in the future, what Jesus is trying to get her to focus on and what he's trying to get you to focus on. He says, now... Salvation is not an event. Salvation is a person standing right in front of you. Salvation is not a memory. Salvation is a person. He is in me. Jesus in you. Amen. That's your hope of glory. And that's what you need to see today for salvation. Jesus is alive. And eternal, the person, eternal life, according to 1 John chapter 5, 20, indwells you. Salvation is him. I'm standing in front of you. I don't have to wait for a future event. I don't know how many people said, well, I'm going to come to church and get saved Sunday. If that's your attitude, you missed it. Yeah. If that's your attitude, you missed it. Or even some people will go as far to say, well, I remember back when I was so-and-so age years old that I walked down forward, but I'm really not sure now. See, you still didn't get a hold of it. Salvation is in front of you, and when you receive Christ, you will know that salvation is eternal. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. I hope you know that today. I sure do. Again, it's not a memory. Verse 27, what Jesus said demanded a response. It demanded a response. Look at verse 27. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord... I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. It demand, and when Christ speaks, when a sermon's preached and you have the Bible right in front of you, it demands a response. You say, is, uh, is everyone going to give a response? I believe they are. Everybody's going to give a response by, I'm not listening to that fellow, what he's got to say, or this is so interesting, I want to find out more. Either Christ is real or he's not real. Amen. So we're looking here at the Bible and what the Bible has to say about the Son of God. He is salvation. In verse number 28, we see Martha's confidence. The Bible said, and when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, the master is come and calleth for thee. Martha's confidence. She was so satisfied in what the Lord Jesus said in verse number 25 and 26 that she doesn't wait for a reply from Jesus to verify her confession. She had become confident in Jesus' identity and his ability to do what he claimed. His identity and his ability 
to do what he claimed. Turn back over to John chapter 4, if you will. John chapter 4, his identity and his ability to do what he says. Jesus, um, the Bible says, was going through Sychar. And uh, it says that he comes to a city, that city in Samaria, Sychar. And Jacob's well was there in verse number 6. And there was a woman there at the well. And Jesus said unto her there in verse 10, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Um, when I was younger, I can't prove, I can't be sure. You know, I'm, thank God I'm saved now. But when I was younger, if somebody would have taken this Bible and explained to me just exactly who Jesus was and what he had done, I may have couldn't have got saved a little earlier. I, I'm thinking I could. And so that's why that, that's why that we talk about it so much here at the Faith Baptist Church. And we give you that opportunity to examine your own life. Well, Jesus said, if you knew who it was, I didn't know that I didn't know who Jesus was. At 26 years old, I found out. Now, my mother talked about Jesus when I was younger, but until I was 26 years old, I did not know who Jesus was. I found out according to John chapter one and verse number one, that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, you hear these verses all the time. The Bible says in verse 14 of John chapter 1, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So God became a man. God became a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and He went to Calvary and satisfied demands that you and I could never satisfy. He had to be born from above. He had to be divine. He had to be the Son of God. For only the Son of God can give life and raise the dead. Yes, sir. He had to be. So we have an authority and we have proof to back it up. Amen. We have proof. And uh, you want to look in the Bible. There was many, 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 many people that saw Jesus Christ when he rose again. All right. So in John chapter number four, he told her that you're going to know who I am and what I have done. And then he tells the woman at the well in verse number 13, he said, whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again, talking about the woman at the well. But in verse 14, he said, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. When you drink him, you will never thirst again. When you eat of him, John chapter number six, you will never, ever hunger again. All right. Now, so we go on. Let's move to the, um, the sensitivity of the Savior there in verse number 33. 34, 35, and 36. Uh, Jesus enters into a cold scene of death and transformed it into a scene of warmth by his love. If you'll notice in verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And then the Bible says that Jesus wept. Jesus wept. He groaned in the spirit, according to verse number 33. He let himself care. He let himself care is what the Bible tells us. The consequences of sin that had caused death and brought sorrow into the lives of people that he loved. He felt it. He was emotional. You know, when we stand beside the grave as they lay a loved one, our, one of our loved ones, they lay that body into the earth and all of that emptiness and all of that sorrow that we feel, let me, I promise you this, he felt the same thing. He felt every pain that we have ever felt. And he's well acquainted with the grief that you bore. Did you know the Bible says in Isaiah 53 that he would be like that? That's, that's what he was, he would be like that, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse number 15, if we have not uh, a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of infirmities. So Jesus Christ knows you and he suffered with you. Amen. He knows you and he suffered for you as well. All right, we got a problem here in verse number 38 and 39. Let's move along quickly. We got a problem. The Bible says in verse number 38, Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. He hath been dead four days. So it looks like a problem. 
Now, from the standpoint of human logic, here's a hopeless scene. A hopeless scene. Uh, Lazarus had been dead for four days, according to verse number 39. Jesus again there groaning the effects of sin and death as he looked around at the sorrow and grief over the curse of sin. And by the way, we know that to be true because Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12 says, Wherefore, as uh, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. So we're all in the same basket. We're all in the same crowd. We were born in sin. And every one of us needs a savior. Now the question is, if you're gonna take time to seek him and find out who he is, I hope you do. Here he is right here. Jesus Christ, here he is. And then in verse number 39, Jesus said, take ye away the stone. You and I both know that Jesus is not in the business of doing tricks. If he wanted to, he could have flipped that stone off with less than a word. Less than a word, just a mere thought. But my dear friend, we know this as well. Men can move stones. Only God can raise the dead. Only God can raise the dead. So Jesus reminded Martha there in verse number 40. He said, said I not unto thee, if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. And it stands the same way in the congregation today. If you will believe him, you will see the glory of God. If you believe him, you won't have to go through any program. You won't have to go through a repeated menu. When you finally get a hold of the very person of Christ and what he did for you and rose again to prove it was all true, the first reaction is, thank you, Lord. I see the glory of God. Thank you, dear God, for what you've done for me. Now, Jesus didn't say to Martha, if you believe, I will do the miracle. It's not what he said. He didn't say, if you believe, I will do the miracle. He did not condition the miracle on raising Lazarus on Martha's faith or Mary's faith. Rather, he said, if she believed him, that she would see the glory of God. Now, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. The sovereign act of Jesus Christ raising Lazarus would have happened whether Martha believed it or not. But for her to see the glory of God in the miracle, she had to have faith in Christ. Not just the corpse resurrected, but the Son of God glorified. Amen. Now, we're to give God the glory. The theme of the universe is the glory of God. God created everything for his glory. Ephesians chapter number one. We are created for his glory. The only thing that does not give God the glory are two groups of rebels, and that's fallen angels and fallen men. We need to trust him, give him the glory. What is the glory of God? What is the glory of God? The glory of God is the revelation of all the attributes of God's person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily according to Colossians. When Moses asked to see God's glory in Exodus chapter number 33, verse number 18, God revealed his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his patience. In Exodus chapter number 34 and verse number six, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in kindness and in truth. Jesus Christ is God's glory. And according to Philippians chapter number two and verse number 11, every knee will bow one day and confess that to be true. Every knee. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you would accept him today and give him the glory? You know, even lost people in that day when he comes back in Revelation 19, they're going to see him, they're going to mourn. But everyone's going to confess that he's Lord. Everyone, everyone, even as they're cast into the lake of fire, they will know who he is. Did you know people in hell today know who Jesus Christ is? But they don't have a chance. There's no second chances. So you make your decision on this side of the grave, on this side of the grave, and I hope you make your decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to earth, he was the glory of God embodied. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter number one, verse number three, that he's the express image of God's person. The express image. He is God. John 14, the manifestation of God's glory. John chapter number 11 reveals one attribute of God's glory, and that is his ability to give life, his ability to give life. Resurrection 
is one of the attributes of God's glory. Christ raised it from the dead by the glory of the Father. Well, so what's the application? Some people, like Martha, go through life and only see the problems. Then comes the ulcers and the worries and so on. And then when God solves the problem for them, all they see is a solution until they focus on the next problem. But for a Christian to keep his eyes on Jesus Christ, he sees more than a solution to his problem. He sees the glory of Christ. He sees the glory of Christ. I don't know how many people's come in church and uh, they, they, they need something. They need something. In their mind, they need something. And when they were younger, they remember Christ and they remember people talking about Jesus Christ. And they knew they had that special feeling when they would walk in a church. I don't know how many people in 40 years I've been preaching have come in churches wanting God to fix something. They would even walk down to the altar at the end of a service and God, would you fix my marriage? Will you help my finances? Will you give my wife back to me? Will you give my husband back to me? Will you let me have my kids back? Will you let me do all of this? And then God, God works in that person's life and answers that prayer and you don't ever see him again till they have another problem. Till they have another problem. Most people are just looking for a solution. But when you focus on Jesus Christ, you'll see his glory. You'll see God's glory. And that's what I'm going to leave you with today. Will you trust him? God became a man, went to Calvary, and on Calvary, God took every, everyone in here, look around, everyone in here, look at, look at who we have here. Everyone in here, God took your sin and he placed it right over here on Christ and then God judged Christ, beat Christ on the cross of Calvary for your sin. How do I know that to be true? Isaiah 53 in verse 10 said, it pleased God to bruise him. And then when God saw the travail of Jesus Christ's soul, verse 11 of that same chapter said that he was satisfied. God is completely satisfied with the work of Christ and I'm asking you to be satisfied with that same work that God's satisfied with. And when you do, my dear friend, that's when you see the glory of God, yeah. the glory of Christ. You'll know you have eternal life. You won't ever have to worry and have any sleepless nights about anywhere you go. How many of you, don't raise your hand, back when I was struggling and didn't know Jesus Christ as my Savior, the Lord God gave me five children, five children. But my two oldest girls were little. I was struggling with this matter of going to heaven. And I would wake up at night because I remembered what people would say to me as I was growing up about the Lord coming back in the clouds and people were going to be caught up. I remember as a married man with two kids opening my little girl's bedroom door and peeping in to make sure they were still there and shut the door. You say, that's crazy. Well, I don't call it crazy. It worked. Because I started thinking about my own soul. Where am I going to go? If, those, if the Lord comes back in the clouds and my babies go, I sure want to be with them. I sure want to be with them. And so all of that compiled with a lot of other things in my life finally drove me to this precious book. I didn't understand it. It was a bunch of Greek to me. I began to read it and I said, Lord, if you'll help me understand it, I'll believe it. And from that point on, truth after truth after truth after truth flooded in my heart and soul and it all came together where I personally could say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for doing what you did for me and I can go to heaven. Are you to that point yet? If you're not, I hope you get to it. I hope you're so miserable with your life until you come to that point. You say, preacher, you shouldn't say that. I do, I mean it. Amen. All right, let's stand to our feet, please. We'll